Amen. All right, Jonah chapter 1. Now hold your finger there in Jonah chapter 1 and go to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. Now Jonah was sent out as a missionary to a foreign country, essentially. He is sent somewhere, and we're going to look at some of the backstory, what happened before he went there. And this is a very important book. Jesus references this book a couple times in the Gospels. So there's some really good stuff we can learn here. 2 Kings chapter 13, we're going to look at some of the good and the bad. And starting out in chapter 1, I'm just going to tell you, Jonah had a bad attitude. Jonah did not want to do what God wanted him to do. He thought maybe he would do it a different way, he'd do something different. And God judged him greatly. And there's an application we can learn tonight that when God has something for you to do, you better just do it. Otherwise, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt the people around you. And I joke, but I like to call Jonah the suicidal soul winner. The suicidal soul winner because he was a prophet. He was a man of God. God used him mightily more than once. And yet, when it came to doing what he was supposed to do, he just he didn't want to do it. He, he thought he would do it a different way or do it his own way. And we're going to see all of that tonight. Now, you're in 2 Kings chapter 13. Look at verse number 14. This is with Elijah. Look, it says in verse 14. <clears throat> Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said unto the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands, and he said, Open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot, and he shot. And he said, The arrows of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrows of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou hast consumed them. Now this is the last thing that Elisha does in his ministry. The king comes to him. He, he, there's problems in the kingdom. They've been, they've been losing territory back and forth. And he comes to Elisha. He's seeking for a blessing. He wants to know what to do with the future. So Elisha uses this symbolism, sort of taking him back. Uh, look at verse 18 here. Look what he says. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. Right? He hit it three times and then he stops. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then thou hast smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died. And they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. So what happens here, Elisha, the man of God, says, hey, this is going to represent your deliverance. You want deliverance? You want to recover? You need to hit these arrows on the ground. And he just does it three times and he stops. And the message here is that, you know, when God tells you to do something, just keep going. Elisha did not say stop. He didn't say hit it and then stay. He said smite, right? I mean, if you want to be in God's way, hey, just keep going. Just keep, can I stop now? God? No, just keep going. Just keep going. Right? So Elisha is giving this message to the king, and immediately he dies after it. Right? That's the last thing we see from Elisha. This is the last great prophet. So, I mean, this is like the ending of a dynasty. And, of course, judgment comes on the nation. Go to the next chapter, 2 Kings chapter 14. Go to verse 23. And in the 15th year... Of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. It says, listen to this, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath under the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hepper. So Jonah is in the northern tribe. He's in Israel. He prophesies God is going to restore the kingdom. And yet this king, coming in with good news and good prophecy, it, he still does that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And of course God judges them. 
And so Jonah sees the land coming back, right? The nation is being restored. They're taking land back. Look, keep reading there in verse 26. He says, For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter. For there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord God said not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, and all that he did, and his might, how he warred, and how he recovered Damascus, and Hamath, which belonged to Judah for Israel, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, even the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his stead. Go ahead and go back to Jonah chapter 1. So we see here, Elisha was like the ending of the prophet, right? The ending of a dynasty of a great prophet. There was a space there. We see that Jonah was prophesying. Jonah was prophesying what God said, that hey, God is going to begin to restore the kingdom. You're going to gain some territory back. They got territory from the southern kingdom. They got territory from the Assyrians. So they're, they're beginning to rebuild their nation a little bit. It, but yet the king did not take it to heart. And thereby fulfilling this prophecy like, hey, you know, you're supposed to keep smiting. Instead, they stayed. Right? You're supposed to keep delivering. Instead, they stopped and they do that which was evil. So this curse was already on the nation, even though God had proclaimed good. And hey, you're going to have conquering and victory. Your heart was not in it. And so the nation began to become attacked, as we'll see later. And so here in Jonah, they, you know, Jonah is this man, he, was, he had success. What he prophesied came true. The nation was restored. Now, not all things were, were, were perfect, obviously, because this king was doing much evil. He was copying the evil of, of other kings. And, you know, so he had success at home. But then God sends Jonah to the enemy. And you think, well, why would God send Jonah to the enemy? Didn't he just protect them from the enemy? And now God's going to send a man of God, a prophet, off to the enemy. You know, and, and he's known as a prophet of restoration. He restored that kingdom. So you think what might be going through Jonah's mind as he says, wait a minute. I prophesy at home and we're restored. And now and we're restored from the enemy, but the king is evil. And now you want me to prophesy to the enemy, but what if God restores them? Right? Jonah has this bad attitude. Well, I don't like those people. Why should I go help them? And, it, and it, 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 it's a bad attitude. Look at verse number one here. Jonah chapter one, verse number one. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now, so we see that he was clearly giving a prophecy of restoration in Israel. But here, even the message is negative. It's like, we see your wickedness, and he says, cry against it. Now, in Genesis 18, it talks about how, you know, the, the cry of Sodom had came up before God, their wickedness. In this case, Nineveh was not as bad as Sodom. Right? God totally, I mean, fire and brimstone, he demolished all the Sodomites. But here, there was still a chance. Here, the Ninevites could be spared. They could be saved. And, and the man of God that he sent, Jonah, was reluctant. He didn't want to go. He, went, he was meandering, right? He's a missionary, but he's meandering. He's all over the place. He didn't go where God told him to do. And, and, and he gets judged for it. And look at verse 3. He says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now listen, Tarshish is in Judah. So he's in Israel. He goes down south. He's heading towards Spain. God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, which is north of Babylon, right? Today, what we would call Iraq, you know, it's in that neighborhood over there. So he's going, literally going the opposite direction. He goes out of his way to go down south to catch a ship to go in the opposite direction of what God wanted him to do. And, you know, he says he was trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Is that even possible? Listen, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God sees the things that you think nobody else knows about. God knows your secret thoughts. He knows your heart. When you're presented with a situation, you say, well, I just won't say what's on my mind. God knows what's on your mind, right? God judges the secret things. He knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. And for Jonah, a man of God, 
that saw a miracle of God by him prophesying once already, they're going to say, well, I'm just going to run from God? Now, is he in the, in the flesh or in the spirit? He's totally walking in the flesh. And God does not bless that when we as Christians walk in the flesh. And here, knowing that God is everywhere, knowing that God foresees things, Jonah decides he's going to do it his way. Well, I know what the right way is, but my, I just want to do it my way. I don't like those people, right? You know, and look, you can't hide from God. In Proverbs 15, he says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. In Psalm 139, he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Right? He sees your secret thoughts. I don't care if it's dark or light, or if you're down in a mountain, God knows what's going on. He sees everything. He created everything. We're like a drop in a bucket. We are his creation. He holds us in his hand. And listen, God has a perfect will for every Christian. I do believe this. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God wants you to be a soul winner. God wants you to preach the gospel. God wants you to take a stand for the Bible. And, you know, most Christians are not doing it. They are outside of the will of God. They're refusing to do what they know they should be doing. And they're under the curse of God because of it. In Hebrews 4, it says, All things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with, of whom we have to do. We have to answer to God. We're going to stand before God one day, and any time you think you can ignore the judgment of God, or the leading of God, or God's will, or the Scripture that's just screaming out at you, hey, do something about your problems, hey, you're a fool. You're a fool. You're walking in the flesh. God wants us to take heed to what He tells us to do. Look at verse number 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Hey, you want to get to the point, and you're like, I don't want to do it, God wants me, okay, maybe God will break you, right? God sends a wind, God makes this miracle, right? He sends a wind out of nowhere, so yeah, I'm, I'm hiding from God, I'm on my path, here I go, going in my own direction, and then God says, okay, you want to run from me? Here come the storms in life. You want to disobey me? Here come the storms in life. Get ready. And listen, Christian, this is the attitude we need to have. We need to be afraid of God. It is our job to be afraid of God. He judges us. He knows our actions. He knows our thoughts and our intentions toward other people. We're called to be loving to the brethren in the church. You know, we're called not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And when you reject the plain scriptures... Be ready for the storms. If you think it's okay to break God's law about fornication or about drunkenness, sobriety, any of I mean, not reading your Bible, not opening your mouth, being ashamed of His Word, get ready for the storms. Here they come. It's going to happen. God judges those that He loves. In Hebrews 12, He says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of Him. For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you disobey, prepare for grief in your life. Just as much as a child, you say, hey, come here. And they turn around and go the other way. Like, okay, you were in trouble. Maybe you're going to get one spanking. Now you're going to get two. Now you're going to get three, right? Now, we're gonna, now we really got to deal with the situation because it's not just a little bit of disobedience. Now it's rebellion, right? God deals with our rebellion by putting us through storms of life. By putting us through grief and difficult times. Look at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So these guys are innocent. Jonah's guilty. And what happens? These guys are losing stuff. They're throwing stuff off the ship, trying to save their life. And where's Jonah? He's just like a criminal that got caught. Well, if I'm going to die, I might as well go to sleep. Right? They've said that you, you catch a criminal, they put him in prison. Well, I'm, I'm caught. What am I going to do? I'm going to enjoy my sleep. Right? If you're innocent, they say you're not able to sleep. You're up and you're worried. You're nervous. What am I going to do? Who am I going to call? Right? I think Jonah was guilty. He knew that his life was expected of him. He knew when he turned and ran, he had to have known it would have been the end of his life. He, he hated Nineveh that much that he was willing to lay down his life rather than obey God and save souls. 
That's a pathetic attitude. That is just sorry. You know, it's a, you know, that guilty sleep. Rather than facing responsibility, oh, I'll just go to sleep and maybe my problems will go away. Or if I just ignore my problems, you know, it's like Pastor Romero used to joke, you know, when you get the bills out of the mail, I just fold it up and hide it. I didn't see it. There's no bill. That doesn't work that way. <laughs> They're going to come knocking. They're going to shut off your power. <laughs> you know, responsibilities will catch up with you. Look at verse number six. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Now that's quite a statement. What meanest thou, O sleeper? I mean, think about it. Things are just falling apart. The ship's about to break. And this guy's sleeping? Now it's interesting, there are some parallels to the story of Jesus in that he was sleeping in the sheep, in, in the, you know, but Jesus stopped the storm, Jesus started the storm. Here Jonah is the fault because of his sin. You know, and ultimately it was when he got it right to a certain extent that, that it, the storm stopped. Look at verse number 7. And they said everyone to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Now, for those that don't know, casting lots is like drawing straws. If everybody cuts a straw of the same size, and you cut one that's shorter, and you go around, everybody gets a straw, oh, you're the guy, you're the problem. Right now, this also was a miracle. God answered, the, these men were trying to figure out, why are we in this storm? Something is wrong. This isn't normal. These are mariners. Right? I think they might have known if the storm was coming, you know, but I, I think they were taken by surprise. I think they were looking for a bigger reason here. And it's obvious, call on your God, maybe you can save us. They called on their lowercase g, gods, and of course they could not save him. So this miracle that the lot fell on Jonah, and it was obvious, it's like, okay, well you're guilty. Why? You know, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. You can get away with something for a little while, but eventually it'll catch up. You may be able to hide something from your spouse, but guess what? They'll find out. You can't hide it from God. God will expose you. God will curse your life. You may be able to hide something from your, your parents, children. When you hide things from your parents, God will judge you. God will take his blessing off of your life when you disobey your parents and you try to hide it from them. You may be able to cut corners at work and the boss doesn't really find out. Nobody really knows. God says, be sure your sin will find you out. It's going to happen one day. You're going to be embarrassed. You're not going to have any excuses at that point. And then what are you going to do? You should get it right. You should stop running. Look what, look what happens here. Verse number 8. Then they said unto him, Tell us, why pray thee? Tell us why pray thee? For whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? Right? They're like, it's your fault, so why is it your fault? Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? What's going on? Right? They're, at, they're playing 20 questions with him. And look at, look at the next verse. He says, and he said unto them, I am in Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. So here Jonah begins to answer all these questions. He's spilling the beans, right? He probably tells I'm a prophet. I've been told to go somewhere, and I'm not. God is judging me. And when they said Hebrew, right, the Hebrews had a reputation. He says, my God is the God that made the sea, right? There's a problem with the sea. They can't figure it out. And it's like, well, my God that I'm running from, he made the sea, right? They knew that there was a problem here. They knew that he was the problem because he's running from the creator God, you know? And as he spills the beans, you know, he's the God of Abraham. I mean, you think about it, these people probably knew of the Hebrews, probably knew of the God of Hebrews. And, you know, so when he told them who he was and what he was doing, where he was coming from, it probably scared them to death. They probably took things very seriously at this point. You know, you think about it, even Jonah himself had a reputation of fulfilling prophecy. He was a man that prophesied for good and it came true, and now there's evil coming upon him. Look at verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Right? This guy is out of his place and they're upset. They're like, Why have you done this? What are you doing to us? You can, it's one thing to disobey God, but when you think you can do something and get away with it, it always affects other people. Yeah. He's actually hurting these people. He's out of his place. He's out of his element. He's out of the will of God. When we sin, it affects other people. Hey, listen, usually it affects people we love. 
it puts a curse on people that we love. And listen, we all have a place in life. We all have a job that we have to do. And if you skirt that responsibility, if you ignore your responsibility, it's going to catch up with you. You think about it as fathers and as dads. We have certain things as men that we are commanded by God that we have to do, right? Don't run from God's will. Men, God wants you to be a witness at work. Men, God wants you to work. Work hard. You're commanded to provide so your wife can do what she needs to do. She has her own responsibilities. You're commanded to teach your own children. You're commanded to lead your wife and your children. If you're ignoring that responsibility, you will hurt them. You're not just hurting yourself, right? As a man, God made you a leader over the house. You set the pace. When your wife acts up, or there's a problem with your wife, or she's emotional, as men, it's easy to blame, oh, let's just blame that weaker vessel, right? But what does God say? Not being bitter. Maybe you should start taking some of the blame. Well, you know what the problem is? I haven't stood in the gap like I should have. I haven't taught her how to have a good attitude. I haven't taught her how to study the Bible. I haven't taught her how to be calm during the storm. Right? As men, God has given us certain responsibilities in raising children, in leading a wife, in working hard, in being a witness in this world. God wants us to prophesy. Don't back down from that. I mean, really, you, you have no excuse. You say, well, I'm not that good at it. I'm not that eloquent. I'm not that loud. I'm not that talented. Listen, I have met some very timid men that when they go out soul winning, they're bold as a lion. Yeah. They talk more at the door to a stranger than they'll talk to me over lunch. It blows my mind. Okay, whatever, dude. Praise the Lord, right? Praise the Lord for the men that are willing to stand up and be soul winners. And your personality is not an excuse. Your job title, your business, that's not an excuse. Your wife is not an excuse. She's your responsibility. We have to take care of her, and we have to do it lovingly. We have to learn to forgive her. We have to learn her to lead her in the right way. You know, the Bible says not to be around an angry man unless you learn from him, right? And I used to work around an angry guy. I mean, angry. This guy would fly off the handle at any moment. And I would always think of that, that proverb when, when I was around him. And you know what? One day I caught myself just flying off the handle. I thought, you know, now I'm guilty. I thought of the proverb when he acted a fool, and now here I am acting foolishly because I'm copycatting who I'm around. So men, when your wife has a problem and, oh, she's acting up, hey, it's your fault. Fix it. You're the only one that can fix it. God's given you that authority and power to lead her. What about the ladies? They have a commandment as well. You know, and listen, as, as Christians in general, we're not supposed to be a secret service Christian. People are supposed to know that we're a, a, a Christian. You know, Pastor Romero recently preached a sermon here about raising children and training children. This is a great sermon. I, I recommend that everybody would go back and visit it again and apply what it says. You know, because the Bible says if you don't correct your children, they will be a shame unto you. You'll be embarrassed. Well, as moms, the Bible says that you're a lawgiver in the house. When dad's away, the mom is setting the law. She's setting the pace. She's responsible for enforcing what the man has put in place. Now listen, all the man has to do is say, uh, well, God said this. That's what we're going to do, right? Guys, it's really easier than we, than we make it out to be. The problem is we just have to do it. Well, I know what God said. Now we just have to do it. That's the hard part is actually applying it. And for women, all they have to do is follow your lead. And men, if you don't obey God's responsibility and you don't obey his law, then the wife will copy you in that. She will not obey his law. The mom is the lawgiver. Right? You know, it's funny. I was out to knock down a door one time. The door opens up and it was a two story home. And you could see a banister in the stairway up to the second story. And there was a child. And I mean, probably a one and a half, two, maybe three at the most, jumping up and down and screaming. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the mom that came to the door had this just this look of total misery, <laughs> just like, oh, and she was like, I can't do uh, what if I can't do anything right now. And I'm like, oh, how many kids? You have? Just one. I'm like, whoa, what are you going to do when you get two or three? You know, God wants you to keep reproducing. What are you going to do when you let one child run all over you? Listen, children are supposed to be a blessing. They're supposed to give comfort to our soul. We're supposed to enjoy them. But if we don't obey God's law about being a lawgiver in the home, guess what? Children are not a blessing. 
right? And too many, this generation today, they're shameful. They let their children lead. It's because they're selfish, and rather than train their children and for them to obey God's law and not be a hypocrite, they just throw them a phone, go watch TV, here, I'll buy you a computer, leave me alone, here, go watch, so I'm, I'm busy, leave me alone. Right? That's the generation we're surrounded by. We're surrounded by a bunch of selfish people, and their children are running the household. That is a shame. That is, that is uh, the, I mean, that's the, 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 the recipe for destruction. Right? One day it's going to cause a lot of problems in their own house. They're going to watch their children destroy their family. Amen. And listen, I know that children are a burden, and I don't have as many as, as most of y'all. In fact, somebody just recently was telling me a story about, well, this child, our oldest, was very difficult at first. But we kept applying correction. God made a promise in His Word, if I apply correction, they will obey. That young man... Those children, we have teenagers in this church that are a blessing to the whole family. And I want to commend the teenagers in this, fam in this church, the older children that are helping with the younger children. That is an awesome responsibility. I believe God will greatly bless you for helping out mom and dad. Listen, when you start from the oldest and they're helping you with the youngest, then mama can enjoy that baby. Mama can take care of the toddler because you got the oldest one trying to help you. And hey, listen, we got a couple of them in our church. Thank God for the teenagers that are obeying their parents. And, and now, hey, I know you might have been a, a troubled child back in the day, but thank God you're obedient today. You're setting the pace for your brothers and sisters. You know, there's a lot of brothers and sisters in the Bible that, that did bad things together. You know, you, you think about Joseph's brothers. There was two of his brothers that sold him off into bondage. They were cursed because of that. Right? You think about the sons of, of, of Judah, Onan and, and uh, forget the first one. Anyway, the, the two brothers both were wicked in the sight of God. They both died because they were wicked. Well, guess what? The younger one probably got it from the older one. Right? Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they were serving together. Why? Because the parents started from the beginning. They, made, they got the foundation right on the first child. Listen, mom, dad, you're a lawgiver in the house. It's our responsibility as Christians to raise up this next generation. And when you go out into the world and you see just how crazy things are getting, if we don't take a stand and raise our children right, then you might as, you might as well just set the whole thing on fire. Listen, our only hope is the next generation. The soul winners that are, that are under 15 in this church, they're valuable. Right? They're probably more valuable than, than us guys that are getting closer to 40 because we've only got so many years left. Right? You get the teenagers on fire for God. You get the children on fire for God. They're willing to learn their Bible. They're willing to become a soul winner. There is hope for the next generation. Proverbs 29, he says, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. That's what the older children are for, I believe. I, you know, because you think about, you know, we're working on this documentary for homeschooling, and there were farmhouse school situations where the older children, once they learned, they taught the younger children. Well, guess what? Then the younger children learn at a faster pace. And listen, God has a perfect plan for families, but when it's out of order, it's going to be like a storm. It's like you're going right through a storm, things aren't working, and you know, I know you can be overwhelmed, you got too many worries, too many things to worry about, hey, stop worrying. Cast your cares on Him, build up your family, obey the law of God. Correct your children, have a foundation. Don't ignore the responsibility, mom and dad. And listen, as singles in the church, we've got a few different singles. You need to serve God with all you've got. You need to make it your goal to be the best soul winner, to be an everyday soul winner, to, to use your talents and your gifts for God in whatever way. Listen, yeah, you need, to, you need to grow in earthly knowledge and wisdom so you can have a good job to support a family, but you need to grow in spiritual wisdom while you can. You need to be reading the Bible, you know, five times a year if you have that kind of time. You know, don't be watching videos and on Facebook and playing video games. That is a snare to the young men, this generation, and you can overcome that by getting your nose in the Bible, by finding God's will for singles. And I believe that, that God uses young men, especially in our types of churches, as soul winner. In Fort Worth, there's a bunch, there's like half a dozen of single guys. They can't seem to find a wife, but they sure can find three, four, five, ten hours a week to go soul winning some of them. And that's awesome. And they have many rewards in heaven. Hey, God sees that. God will bless you when you obey His commandment. Look at verse number 11. Let's pick it back up here. So Jonah has sinned. He's caused problems. Look at verse number 11. It says, Then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee 
that the sea may be calm unto us. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Right? They're saying, what can we do to restore peace? How can we get things back to the way they were? Verse 12, And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So I call him a, a suicidal soul winner. He's like, okay, well, if I can't go back and I can't do what's right, just kill me. Just kill me. Just throw me over the boat. Let's end it now. I, I really believe that he had such a negative attitude, he expected to die either there or in the process. And so he's just like, well, this, my time is up. This journey's over. I've ran from God long enough. It's time to die. And, you know, you think about it in the past. You know, if you remember in Joshua, the book of Joshua, they had this great victory in, in Jericho. And then they go to Ai and they get defeated. And it comes out that Achan had taken the accursed thing. He took some gold and some garments. And he's more worried about physical things. And they begin to have these problems. And it comes out he was guilty. They put him to God destroyed the guy. Right. He dies. And then the blessing returned. So maybe Jonah's thinking, well, you know, it, it worked for Achan. They killed Achan and the blessing came back. So for the sake of these mariners, if they just throw me overboard, maybe they'll live. Right? Now, I believe in the middle of all this, though, I believe that Jonah was still doing what he did best, and that's being a prophet. I believe that Jonah being called being a prophet, even though he's saying, woe is I, I'm running from God, I'm, I'm in disobedience, I believe he was still preaching the gospel. I believe he's still advocating for faith in God. I, I really believe that. If you look at the next verse, in verse 13, it says, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them, right? So they, hey, the solution is, you got to get rid of me. I'm the problem. I'm a curse on you. The only way to fix it is get rid of me. And these guys were kind enough to say, well, maybe we can have an intervention. Listen, interventions do not work. I've never seen an intervention that actually worked. You know, you've seen these where they say, well, this, this family member has a drug problem. If we can all just, you know, confront them and let them know that we're not going to support their problem. No, interventions don't actually work. You know, when your sin destroys your family, you know, you, I, you know, it's an attitude problem. It's a heart problem. You don't care about your family enough. You don't care about yourself. You don't care about God. And these people, these men, these mariners had already lost all their wares. That was probably their income. They probably threw off the load that they were going to make profit from just trying to spare their lives. And they were nice enough to try to have this intervention for this guy. But the ship's breaking. They're hurting people. Right? And, and so, I mean, it still, it comes to a point where I think that finally this path of destruction hurt enough people where the mariners finally said, okay, maybe we do need to throw you over the boat. Look at the next verse, verse 14. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, has done it, done as it pleased thee. They're saying, Lord, this storm is because of you, Lord, this judgment is because of you. Spare us, and we don't want to kill anybody innocent. Uh, if you notice, these mariners, at first, they're calling on their own God, lowercase g. Now they're calling to God, and they're saying, you're doing this, you're doing what pleases you, Please don't consider us murderers if we throw this guy overboard. Their whole attitude changes, and that's why I believe that Jonah preached the gospel to them. There's, there's several things about Jonah's preaching that we, can, that we can see in the text, and there's other things that are sort of assumed. That's a theory that I have, and I'll show you why. Look at the next verse, verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging immediately. They throw him overboard, and in their mind, well, he's dead. The sea stops. Can you imagine being in the middle of a storm and then just stops just that quick? These mariners had faith that God would answer that prayer, and he did. And, you know, the intervention failed, but, you know, I think separation is a necessary part of every Christian's life. I believe these people are like, okay, now we've got to separate ourselves from this guy to get away from that curse. And, you know, there's a saying, you can't help somebody that doesn't want to be helped. Right? If somebody, oh, you've got problems with your budget, let me help you. If they don't care, you can't help them. I don't care how much information you give them. You know, if they don't care what, how, how much their drinking is destroying their life, if they don't want to change it, there's nothing you can do to help them. It's like force feeding a baby. The baby eats when the baby's hungry, and you can't change that. 
You try force feeding the baby, it's just gonna come right back out. They're just gonna spit it right. They don't care. They're spitting it over. They don't care, right? And there are people like that in life, and sometimes there are Christians like that that are in sin, and they don't care enough about themselves or their brother to get things right, and the curse begins to affect everybody around them. How bad do you want God's blessing on your life? Are you willing to pursue God's blessing? Are you willing to obey the commandments? Are you willing to fix the problems that He's revealing to you through Scripture, through preaching? Because if not, then you're just like that baby spitting it back up. Right? You're like somebody that refuses to be helped. And you know, the, the intervention failed, but separation was successful. And in the Christian life, there comes a time as a Christian, we just need to step away. Yeah. Well, you're my brother, but I'm done here. I, there's nothing I can do for you. I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here when it all crashes. Right? In Proverbs 22, it says, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Cast out the scorner. You know, I saw somebody rebuke somebody a long time ago, and, and it, it was a lady that was hurting her family. And another lady said, you need to stop, you're destroying your family. And when the scorner left, contention ceased. That's, how, that's the way it works. This is biblical. You know, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, it talks about judgment in the church. It talks about when somebody is in sin, there's certain sins, fornication, drunkenness, railing. There's certain things. If you're doing it in the church, the Bible says to kick you out of the church in the name of Jesus Christ, deliver you unto the Satan, right, for the destruction of the flesh. You want to be known as a drunk and claim this church? We're supposed to kick you out of the church. And if God lets Satan destroy your body, you'll at least end up in heaven. You got that going for you. But most of the time, people hit rock bottom, they're shunned, they realize they've, they've done damage, they begin to go search after God and get it right. And sometimes we have to hit rock bottom to get things right in our life. You know, it says, wherefore come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. And as Christians, we have to make sure that we don't go along with somebody in sin too long. There comes a point where you stop and you rebuke them. They say, hey, what are you doing? You're destroying everybody around you. You need to stop. You need to change your heart, change your attitude, seek the Lord, right? Because sometimes it, there can be a point where it's too late. Look at verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Right? So these guys, they fear the Lord. They offer a sacrifice. They make a vow. Again, I believe there was some preaching going on through the storm. Right? Even, listen, Christian, when you find yourself in a storm and it's up and down, well, woe is me, time is rough, I'm going through a trial like you wouldn't believe, still take those opportunities to preach the gospel to people, to defend the Bible, to help people. Listen, I, I believe these guys got saved. You know, it's just a theory. I could be wrong on that. It's not really that important. But it's not often you see somebody that truly fears the Lord and is willing to make a vow to God. You know, and that's what we do. I mean, we got saved. I, hey, Lord, I believe you. I trust in you. And I believe these guys got saved. I believe they were blessed because even though of all the destruction around them, they lost all these physical things, I believe they got their, saved, their souls saved because Jonah at least was willing to preach the gospel to them. Now look at verse number 17 here. It says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So another miracle here, God prepares a fish. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Listen, God prepares trials in your life for you sometimes so that you'll grow through it. You know, you think about, you think about David. God prepared a lion to attack David so that David could come out a mighty man, so that he could go on and defeat giants. If David refused to fight that lion, if he just ran, if he said, well, it's, it's pointless, I can't beat a lion, we, would, we wouldn't be reading about David and how he defeated a giant, right? In this same way that there was a fish prepared against Jonah, you know, sometimes there's trials in our life, and if, if we try to run, there's going to be a storm, we may hit rock bottom, but I do believe, hey, you're saved, you can still have victory. I don't care how far along you've gotten, and I've had friends that just, they make some pretty dumb mistakes. And, and over and over, and it's you know, it, uh, there, there's still a point of recovery as long as you're alive. If you're saved, I don't care how bad your life is, there's a point for victory and recovery. God can use you. 
I, you may have an awesome story about the, the storm you've been through, the, the trials you've been through. You know, in Job, he says, he says, but he knoweth the way that I take. But when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Listen, even if you're, you say, well, listen, I'm going through some stuff you don't know about. I'm in that fish's belly right now. I'm down in the sea. I'm in the storm. You can come forth as gold. God wants us to learn from the life of Jonah. Listen, he was a soul winner, but he was a suicidal soul winner. He had a bad attitude. He had the wrong priorities. He was selfish. He was more worried about what he thought was right for his country than what God said to go do for another country. Right? He, was, he wasn't thinking about other people. He was thinking about himself. Well, I'm comfortable here. I like what I'm doing. Why should I worry about them? Hey, worry about them. Go help somebody else. Seek their good, and then God will bless you. Look, you're in Matthew 16. Look at verse number 1. It says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered, now listen, he's preaching to them. Well, why should I believe? Show me a sign. Right? Have you guys ever had somebody at the door that's kind of like, well, prove it to me. Yeah. It's faith. You have to have faith. I'm, to, I'm, I'm demonstrating my faith. I'm revealing the scriptures. I'm preaching the gospel. The power of the Holy Spirit is working. Don't ask for a sign. Like that's a, don't wait for a sign as a Christian to get things right in your life. Don't wait for a sign as an unsaved person to say, well, you know what? I, don't, I, I just got in a wreck and I lived. Maybe that's my sign. Maybe now I'll put my faith in Jesus. No, don't wait for a sign. That's wicked. And as Christians, we shouldn't do the same thing. Well, Lord, I, I know you want me to do the right thing, but, I, you know, things are working out, you know, even though I'm still not sober. You know, Lord, I'm still living in fornication. I'm waiting for the sign so I know to do things right. No, don't wait for a sign. Get it right. Get it right now. God will bless that attitude. Look at verse number two. He answereth and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Jesus is telling the scribes, hey, they're waiting for, oh, show us some big sign. Why don't you call fire down from here? Why don't you do a miracle for us? Right? They've already seen his miracles of healing. They've already heard of his reputation all around. Well, show us another sign. Give us something else. Why? They, didn't, they wouldn't have believed it anyway if he had. And he says, I'll give you a sign. It's the prophet Jonah. Now, we know through the story, and we were not covering it this week, but Jonah died and goes into the well's belly. Essentially, it's like he went to hell and he comes back up three days later. A picture that Jesus Christ would die for the sins of the whole world. That he would go to hell and suffer for your sin so you don't have to go. And all he wants of you is to believe that. That's the sign that Jesus gave. That's the importance that Jesus put on this prophet. And listen, Jonah made a lot of mistakes, but at least he preached. He preached the gospel. He had some things right, but he did have a bad heart. He, he did have a bad attitude. And listen, you're saved. You're here tonight, and you've got something wrong in your life. Don't wait for a sign to get it right. If you're here tonight and you say, well, I'm not saved. I wouldn't call myself a Christian. Don't wait for a major sign in your life before you put your trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, you better figure it out right now. God will give you opportunities and opportunities. And if you just harden your heart and say, I don't, I've heard that before, God may take you before you have a chance. Listen, this generation was selfish. They had a wicked heart. Jesus said they were adulterous in their heart. They're always seeking after something else because they were never happy. We as Christians should not be like that, waiting for a sign to get things right. I believe all of us have the, the Spirit revealing things to us that we can fix in our own life. Get it right while you can. Listen, God prepared a fish for Jonah because of his rebellion. He hurt others. He hurt himself. He was a soul, suicidal soul winner, right? His friends, the people, they tried to intervene, but yet that didn't work. It was when he had to cast him out. If there's somebody in your life that you love, and you're like, man, I got a buddy, and he's a Christian, but he's, just, he's drinking, and he's drinking, and he won't get it right, you need to separate. You need to separate. That's God's plan so that they'll learn to get it right. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Jonah. Lord, thank you for the prophet that even though he was disobedient and rebellious, Lord, you gave him multiple opportunities to, to fix his heart and get it right. 
Lord, thank you that he did turn around and go preach the gospel to Nineveh. Lord, I pray you would help us as we study this out and learn from it, that you would help us to make an application in our own life. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all the people that are here. Lord, I pray that you would send us out safely. Help us to travel where we need to go. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. In closing, let's take our hymnals and turn to Song 86. Song 86, In the Garden. Song 86.